Gentlemen, we've got a special episode for you today. This is going to be the first woman to ever appear on the Manlyhood Mancast. Who is it? You'll find out right after this. Are you ready to live life to the full? Are you ready to rise up and live a life of honor? Are you ready to boldly step into a life of courage? This is the Manlyhood Mancast. And here's your host, Josh Atcher. Gentlemen, welcome back to the Manlyhood Mancast. I am glad that you chose to tune in today. Today's guest is going to be something special. It's going to be something different. It's going to get you to think, and it's not going to be a man, which is something a little bit different for us. But I think that today's guest is going to bring a really unique perspective. I want to extend a personal invite to you today to join our private Facebook group, the Manlyhood Man Cave. It's the place where you're going to get plugged in and connected with other men. And it's going to help you grow and level up because we build a brotherhood. We build a camaraderie and we look out for each other. We encourage each other. We give each other advice. And the one rule is we build each other up here. That's what we do. And I think that spirit of care has really created some really unique and awesome conversations. Even with people with very opposing and different worldviews, we've been able to learn a lot. So I want to encourage you to join and invite and be a part of the Manlyhood Man Cave Facebook group. Now, let's get right into today's episode. She's creating what she calls the opposite of OnlyFans. It's a movement to help guys break free from porn addiction. It's called Fight the Beast. This is the story of Heather Nielsen right here on the Manlyhood Mancast. Heather, I am glad that you are with us on the Mancast mancast today you are the first woman to be on the mancast which is kind of an honor i'm i'm pretty tightly guarded with some of my guests you know and so uh there's not a lot of ladies i would want on to be honest with you so i'm kind of glad to have you because i think you've got a really interesting perspective that i think a lot of our guys can learn from so thank you for being on the show thank you so much i'm excited to be here heather why don't you tell me a little bit about uh your story, how you got involved with the work that you're doing and maybe kind of where it comes from. I think it, I think it's a really cool uh, perspective. And I think you've got an interesting message that uh, most people wouldn't have the opportunity to share the way that you do. So I think, I I think your story in that is kind of interesting if you wouldn't mind sharing. Yeah. So first kind of the overview of my organization Um, I started Fight the Beast, um, just recently rebranded it. I've been doing it for a while, though. Um, Fight the Beast is basically an organization fighting addiction. And I focus on pornography and masturbation um, as, for me, the two addictions that are destroying home and families. Well, all sex addiction, right? Particularly hurting individuals, the heart, families, relationships, things like that. Um, But we work with a wide variety of addictions. I guess the way that I got into it, and it's funny, I think about this all the time. I've had a really interesting path in life. And as I look back at my challenges, I'm like, wow, well, now I'm really able to use them. And it's all worked out kind of cool. Um, I got married kind of young. Uh, My first marriage, it was abusive. I was a little naive. Looking back now, I can be like, oh, he was cheating. Oh, he had a porn addiction. Oh, there was masturbation constantly. Now I know that. But I was really naive and kind of blind to that in my first marriage. Um, It didn't work out. He was abusive. I left. I got remarried. And same thing. I'm experiencing these same problems. I found porn. And, you know, he's locked in the bathroom at weird times. And I'm like, you know, it's just breaking my heart. And I'm like, why? And and there we had problems in the bedroom. He had problems connecting with the kids. And I was just like, oh, I can't do this. Um, we ended up getting divorced after a few years again. And I found myself single. And I was like, okay, I've tried this twice. And I was kind of scared. I had three kids with me. And I could just, there was this deep sense of pain. Um, I forgot to mention, um, I didn't grow up with my biological father because of his addictions. And my stepfather also questionably possibly had some addictions after he divorced my my mom and disowned me. And I'm just like, okay. And there's four major male roles in my life, all gone, all the same culprit. And 
so I started just kind of casually talking to my friends about it, people I care about, guy friends. And I just go up and be like, hey, so how's your porn addiction going? And they're like, what porn addiction? How do you know? And I'm just like, I know. 97% of men today masturbate or watch porn regularly. And so I was just like, it, it's going on. And so they'd open up to me and I started seeing a change in them. They started being like, hey, this is really helpful. I've actually gone a month now without it. Thank you so much. And so I kind of just woke up one day and I was like, I want to help more men. This is the way that we change families. This is the way that we help our society. This is how we restore masculinity in the world. And so I just became very passionate about it. And everyone thought I was kind of crazy, but I just went for it. I was like, no, I'm going to be the opposite of OnlyFans and create a business that's geared towards helping people quit. And it took off surprisingly fast. So, yeah, I think that it's really interesting to hear your story behind it and that motivation. It actually, it's kind of painful to hear. I mean, not like you said it, first of all, that stat of 97% of men, that's painful to hear. No, I know that it earlier in my life, that was a huge issue for me. I almost lost my marriage over it and had to go through a very hard battle to overcome that. And I know a lot of men who are in the throes of that, they're still in that battle. They and even I even remember times when maybe it was latent and I wasn't actively involved in those issues, but there were times in my life where even though I wasn't actively involved with it, it was just a constant fight to keep my mind away from it, you know, and, um, you know, to hear your story and your process of that and how it affected you both as a girl growing up and then as a, as a wife and mother, I mean, that's, that's heartbreaking. And now as a single mom, that for me is really frustrating too. Like whenever my kids need a dad there, I'm like, sorry, you know, I'm trying to date, but I can't find a man who's not actively doing these things right now. And so I'm like, until I find somebody that's kind of worthy of that role in the home, you know, yeah. all are suffering a little bit. Yeah. And, and even having the, you know, a, a man in the home who, is good. It's still hard for them and it's going to be hard for them. Oh, for and sure. The advantage is, you know, I mean, you can be around good men who even if, you can be around good men who, even if they're struggling, can set a good example in a lot of ways. But uh -huh. I think you're right. You want to be careful before you open that door into your home. You know? For me, not to clarify, because, you know, I work with people all the time. My friends, I work with them. I love everyone that I, you know, I do coaching and I love all of them. For me personally, I cannot go through that heartbreak one more time, but um, I love, love seeing people overcome this and seeing them as they, as they distance themselves from it and as they make progress in their life in that way, I see so many changes in them and it's, it's amazing to watch. So you say your background is in addiction recovery. Is that kind of, were you working with, you know, maybe what people normally think of maybe drugs, alcohol, was that, is that something that you were working with before you shifted this direction or? Up to those other things. Um, as people come to me, they'll be like, Hey, you know, I'm dealing with porn, but I'm also dealing with alcohol. I'll be like, yeah, you know, it's the same principles. It's the same mindset. It's the same changes we need to work on. And so, um, I kind of take on those other ones as well, but yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of times people don't understand how much of, of our culture is saturated with this. You know, I mean, um, doing what I do with manlyhood, I'm on social media a lot and I'm scrolling or I'm posting or I'm trying to interact. And I just can't believe the amount of garbage that's there. And, and I've got, you know, my feed, you know, I'll literally, I'll take a day and I'll like go through my feed and I'll just like, like a thousand knife or gun posts or motivational quote posts to make sure I'm trying to tell the algorithm what I like. And then, you know, it still will try to hammer stuff at you and throw it at you and try to get you to pay attention. And it's like, I can't imagine how difficult it would be if I were in the, the throes or in the hard spaces where those darts stick and land in you, you know, that's a lot harder to fight. Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, and so I find most of the people I work with, when they're really serious about recovery, they do have to distance themselves from the normal world, which is really, it's sad and it's unfortunate, but they're doing it for their families. They're doing it for their relationship with God or for just being, even sometimes a lot of people are doing it just for the idea of, I don't want this in our community, in our society. This is not, 
healthy for America. This is not healthy for our world with all the things it contributes to human trafficking and child trafficking. So that's why my organization, right? It's fight the beast. This is a beast that is destroying our communities, our culture, our families and individuals. And so even when we look at it, not from, cause some people don't like the word addiction. They don't want to think of it like an addiction, wherever you stand regarding the word addiction, a lot of people can agree with the fact that overall this is um, like the internet access of pornography has, our society has taken a nosedive because of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would definitely agree with that. And I think I've seen it repeatedly, you know, you talk about, um, you know, when you talk about human trafficking and, and the like, I, one of the things that I've heard from some guys recently is they've heard stories that they didn't know before. You know, I, I think they, when they hear the stories and the, the, of, of girls who were brought into this industry to create something to entertain them, and they realize how dark and how twisted it is. I think it, I think it kind of changes their perspective a little bit. It's, it's no longer just like, Hey, let me hit play on this. When you see what's actually happening, it kind of opens your eyes, you know? Yeah. I had one client one time, um, he started getting, he started doing a lot better when he realized, I guess he watched one video and he's like, I could just see in the actor's eyes, they didn't look comfortable. They didn't look happy. Something was deeply wrong. And he's like, I just couldn't let go of it after that. Like, I just couldn't, I couldn't keep watching because I could tell something was wrong. And we hear that there's a lot of reports, a lot of people saying this, um, but unfortunately, pornography is no longer like a film industry. It's everywhere. It's teenagers, um, sexualizing themselves on social media. It's everyone uploading their own private videos on Pornhub. And so it's a little hard to separate. Well, it's extremely difficult to separate. Okay. Who is doing this voluntarily? Who is not, who is, you know, we don't know who these people are and that's really scary. Some of these people could be missing persons. Some of these people, and they are, we find missing persons through sites like Pornhub and they're finding children through sites like, you know, child sex trafficking and, and child pornography websites. And it's scary. Yeah. And just the idea that what you think you're watching, even, even when you think of maybe the more commercial side and you think of, you know, the girls who are making a lot of money or the women who are making a lot of money, there's a difference between a girl and a woman. So the women who are making a lot of money and they're like, oh, well, they're making money and they're enjoying it. But then you hear stories of these women and they're leaving the industry and they're telling you, no, that's not what happened. <laughs> that's not how this worked. This was not what it, it appeared to be. So yeah, let's talk about that. So I heard that comment a lot. And in my marriages, that was the number one argument is like, it's not hurting anyone, right? They're making money. They enjoy it. They're getting attention. It's not hurting anyone. And as a wife, I was like, except me, like it's hurting me. It's hurting your, uh, your, like it hurt him and his confidence in the bedroom in a lot of ways. It made sex instead of a loving relationship connection thing. It made it more of like a performance thing. And I was like, oh, this is not the connection I was looking for. Um, and it just made things really uncomfortable. And, but it goes a lot deeper than that because I mean, deep down, pretty much if anyone's honest with themselves, it's hurting, it's hurting yourself. It's not so much about what, you know, so-and-so on the internet, whatever's going on in their life, but it's hurting you personally. And um, so I get that question a lot. And a lot of the ways, you know, even just addiction itself, if you're compulsively turning to anything to control your mood, to control your body, to control your temper, your frustration, you're just, that's unhealthy. That's a dependency. We have to, if we want to become truly strong for men, if you really want to develop your masculine energy. You have to break away from those things that are dependencies and vices. Um, but it's also, it hurts your ability to connect and empathize. Um, and then when we look at, uh, at, as teenagers, like I look at teenagers, dads who are listening, you know, it's important for you to understand how this is affecting your teenage daughter, your teenage son. 
if this is allowed in your home, your teens are, you know, they're as exposed to it just as much as we are as adults these days. There's no difference between my TikTok and a 13 year old's TikTok, unfortunately, um, and the content they see. But, you know, it's affecting their relationship with parents. This is why we're seeing a huge divide in families. Families aren't emotionally connecting because pornography, it kills that. Well, I think, you know, back to when, even when my kids were young, when we were going to watch television, we would sit in a room and watch a television show together. You know, we would all get together and we had it, you know, maybe it was Doctor Who or whatever. We'd watch a show together and then we would talk about it. And it's funny how in just a short amount of time with everything being streaming and everything being on demand, how we've all segregated into our little holes into our little cubby holes and the kids are watching in one room on their device and I'm watching in another room and my wife's watching because, you know, I mean, let's face it. I don't want to watch the great British baking show, but my wife loves to watch that, you know? And so we get, we get compartmentalized and then next thing, you know, you have no idea what anybody else is doing and that accountability uh, is gone. You know, you've got to work extra hard to create that. And so I think, you know, culturally that shift of individualized streaming and entertaining yourself, I think it's also helped to enable some of these problems as well. Yeah, I, I often think about just if we watch personal entertainment from starting in like the 50s, the progression and how it's affected society, you can see it in a lot of ways. The car, the car, cars became accessible to teenagers in the 50s and 60s, teen pregnancy went up. Um, you know, people started listening to their own music. They stopped connecting with families in the same way. And, and slowly as the internet has gotten more addictive, um, and just, I mean, the internet's addictive on its own, even beyond just pornography. But when we have um, these images constantly showing up, it is extremely difficult for people to quit. So, which kind of brings me to, uh a real practical question is what can a guy do if that's where he's at? You know, he's got an addiction, he's got an issue and he's like, all right, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. Something's got to change. What, what's some practical advice to help him? Like, where does he start? Yeah. So I'm working on putting together right now, sometime in this next week, I'm going to be releasing a 30 day challenge guidebook that kind of helps people walk through the process of here's, a few of the fundamentals, right? Because right now I have a 150 page book on the process of quitting. Um, but this is kind of the condensed version of that. And a lot of it starts with actually deciding that you're ready to. And the longer I've done coaching, the more I've started to actually push away clients that come to me and say, hey, I was thinking about quitting. Mm -mm. I don't want to mess with that because I don't want you going through that relapse cycle. If you're on the fence, you're going to get hurt. You've got to be either on one side or the other. Because once, you, once you're more fully committed one way or the other, you know, if you're fully committed to quitting, then you're ready to start. Um, so the first one is just really getting ready for that mentally, accepting that it's the right thing to do, accepting that that's what you want for your life. Um, paying attention, I always ask people, you know, pay attention to what is the negative effects in your life. Is this hurting you? Is it maybe if you're in a relationship or you're married, is it causing, is it building a wall? Do you feel like you're able to be fully intimate with your partner? Do you feel like there's things that you're holding back? Do you have secrets? Are those secrets hurting you? How is it affecting your self-esteem, your confidence? Um, so look at all of those things. How is it affecting your mood, you know, throughout the week, things like that. And then once they're fully, fully ready to quit, um, then the next step is really just to, I guess the next one really is to remove the triggers, right? So as long as you still, if you're still getting on Instagram and you're following 25 porn stars, you're gonna have to get rid of that. <laughs> um, so that's the next big one. And then from there, we work on setting goals and forgiving yourself. Um, this one's the coolest I'll share. And this is the one that I've been working on the most that I love. 
I love this principle and I use it in my life every day. It applies to everyone. I don't care if you watch porn or not. This is quality um, self-care advice. But underneath, so sexuality can be triggered two different ways, essentially. The first one is a deep love and desire to be close to someone, right? That's this, this deep, like, if you've ever felt that connection where you're just like, I just love you so much. I want to be close to you. I want to be with you. There's that love. The other side is this urge, this horniness or this trigger that you just are like in the mood, right? This, that's where this is coming from. If you look in that moment and ask yourself, what do I need right now? Why do I feel like I need this? there is always a need. And so I work with people on trying to find what that need is. So it might be, I'm feeling insecure and I want validation. It might be, I'm feeling stressed and I really want a stress relief right now. Um, it could be, I have a headache and this will take the headache away. Whatever it is for that person, we, t we look at that need and we dissect that need and we say, okay, you're not actually wanting a loving connection with somebody. You're actually just wanting this need right now. Let's fill that need. Let's work on actually a, fixing the problem instead of just slapping a you know, selfish Band-Aid on top of it. Yeah, I think about that honestly is an issue. Like you said, it works across the board. I know you know, I, uh, I, I've got some weight to lose and I find myself in that situation where I'm like, am I really craving this food or am I just like thirsty or do I need to take a walk <laughs> or, or do, or am I just stressed and I'm eating because it, you know, any addiction can fall in that pattern and removing those triggers and knowing them. It's also an opportunity maybe where things kind of get deep. You might realize that like that need for validation or whatever might go a lot deeper for some people than they want to admit, I know with me, I had some deep wounds and deep issues that I didn't understand at the time. And as I have grown over the years, I kind of understand where they came from. And I think I still process through some of that and understanding, you know, this might not be as simple as just, oh, I've got an urge. Like there might be something deep going on that you need to work through. Yeah. Um, and I think the really cool thing is it's not necessarily that we're fixing I don't necessarily dig into things like traumas and past experiences, even just on the surface level, it's cool to see, like for me, a big trigger is always stress. Like when I'm stressed and I start getting weird thoughts in my brain, I'm like, hmm, something's going on, right? And if I pinpoint that stress, well, then I can take that knowledge and I can go put it into some real self-care. So instead of using something like pornography or masturbation to temporarily relieve my stress, which they're both really unhealthy and toxic, I can then say, okay, I'm going to do something healthy to relieve my stress. Like I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to, you know, for me, if it's, it might be an insecurity issue. Well, I need to go meditate for a minute and I need to think through my insecurities. I need to come to terms with them. I need to make a game plan for my future. That's a long-term situation that makes your life infinitely better as opposed to the short-term thing that you're going to regret in half an hour anyway. Yeah, I think that's definitely worth taking the time to think about. We talked a little bit about this too with where our culture is kind of saturated with it. I remember when I was struggling and the removing of triggers, there were, there were TV shows that were not necessarily bad shows, you know, but for whatever reason, the lady on it was particularly attractive and it would bring something in my mind. You know, I mean, I had to, you know, I had to stop using the computer late at night and it had to make a complete, uh, complete and drastic change of the way I did my life. Because if you don't like push it, <laughs> I mean, and, and it sounds scary at first, so maybe you have to start small, but if you don't cut it all out, those things are going to make you want it again, you know? Yeah, I don't watch romance movies for that very reason. Anytime my friends want to watch a chick flick, I'm like, no, it's going to make me frustrated. I already know this. And that's another thing I teach people. Like, you have to realize your thoughts. So you never, there, you never perform an action without first thinking about it. And so first you have to work on your thoughts, right? That's 
that's going to be the direction you're going to go. And so if you're spending all your time thinking about sex or women or, you know, these lustful thoughts or whatever, that's going to start affecting you, right? It affects your body. Physically, when you think those thoughts, it releases hormones, it increases, you know, pressure and production and all of these things. And so as long as people are continuing to think these thoughts, you're going to continue to be triggered. So for me, even as a woman, I'm like, I don't want to tease myself in that way. I don't want to feel frustrated because I know that I'm not interested in acting on those feelings. Um, and so, yeah, it, it can come down to, there can be a lot of triggers, but it does go down, right? What has that been your experience? Like once you get away from the addiction, you can come back to normal. Yeah, I would say 100%. Um, in fact, I remember a good friend of mine telling me, you know, and, and that's the other thing that I think is important is having people in your life who can hold you accountable and challenge you and say, how you doing, man? And they might just be saying, how you doing? But you know that they're asking you, how are you doing with this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I remember that friend telling me, he's like, look, it gets better. Like, this is hard. And they keep hammering, you know, all these thoughts keep hammering you. But the more that you say no, the stronger you get. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I typically see around two weeks, the physical urges really go, well, not the physical urges, but just the discomfort really starts to go down. And then by like that month mark, a lot of people are like, wait, I don't have urges anymore. Is this normal? And I'm like, yay, <laughs> take it as a blessing because it means that you are, you're kind of your body stabilizing. Um, one of the things that listeners might be really interested in I'll bring up here is the testosterone cycle. And a lot of people don't know about this. It's like, it blows my mind. I'm a woman and I'm like, I feel like I'm the only one sometimes who knows about this. So men have a seven day testosterone cycle and a 21 day testosterone cycle. The seven day cycle is seven days after ejaculation, your testosterone peaks like 200% or something. I don't know exactly the number, but I know it takes a huge peak. So day five, six, and seven are the most likely days for relapse simply because your testosterone is higher. And so a lot of people, they feel like when they get to that day five, six, and seven, they're like, I just can't keep going. Well, the thing is, um, it's just, you have to be able to say it's just the hormones. It's just the hormones. Kind of like a woman who's maybe PMSing as a woman. I know that I better keep my mouth shut. If a few, those few days of the month, I'm emotional, it's probably fine. It's just me. It's just my hormones. And I have to get through that. Well, with this testosterone cycle, men are the same way. You have to just get through it. The 20, so that one's based on ejaculation, seven days after ejaculation. Men who have quit usually have, if they're not in a, if they're not still having sex or not married, they're not in a relationship about every 21 days, they'll have another peak. They'll likely have a nocturnal emission or a wet dream, and then they'll go on merrily on their way. It'll come again about three weeks. So people that I've helped quit um, completely are like, yeah, about every three weeks, I have two or three days of urges. I have a wet dream and it's over. And that's, that's all they have to suffer at that point. Whereas the people who are in the addiction cycle are like every six hours, every day, every two days. <laughs> I am. Um, I, I mean, I've heard that a man thinks about sex every 60 seconds. And I mean, honestly, like, even if I'm doing well, I mean, that's a common thing. I mean, it, 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 I have no idea whether the statistics of it are true, but you know, I mean, it's a common thing that, it, that we think about it and we make jokes about it and it's there, you know, and, and it doesn't help that it's literally on every billboard and magazine ad that, you, <laughs> you know, it's everywhere. And so you think about it a lot, but I think that the idea of, you know, conquering this and changing the way this works is, is massive. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the testosterone cycle, I think if I look at my life, I think that makes a lot of sense. Actually, I think that makes a, a whole lot of sense. But the research is on my blog for any viewers who want to go check it out. I do have a blog post in there that explains exactly the sources and everything. So I'm not just making this up, but, um, it's shocking to me. I feel like, I don't know. I enjoy it. I enjoy promoting that <laughs> because it, it's important to know what your body's doing. Um, the cool thing about it, though, is it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It also means so all the great, great fighters like Mike, who is it? Mike Tyson. 
and Muhammad Ali, I think, um, they both used this cycle for their advantage. So um, Muhammad Ali, I believe he would go three weeks, or Mike Tyson, one of them, I'm not exactly sure. One of them would go about three weeks before a fight to have that explosive testosterone energy that would happen on those days of their cycle. And same thing with some of them do it for a week, right? No ejaculation a week before a fight. Why? Because you can lift harder, you can run harder, you can fight harder when you have that spike in testosterone. So it's really an advantage for men when you can control it and use it for your advantage. I know that a lot of men in general actually suffer from low testosterone and they don't understand why. And I think that that could be a lot to do with it is if they're wasting their, uh, their hormones on a 15 minute or less <laughs> experience that is not fulfilling or helpful, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It wastes a lot of vital nutrients. If you think about it, semen is supposed to be the most nutrient dense of all of the body, bodily fluids. And so when you're wasting that all the time in a way that is not productive and not helpful, and it's actually kind of subtly, I mean, not subtly, it's seriously hurting you as far as um, your confidence and your, um, your needs. It's almost like a slap in the face, like, hey, this isn't real, but it's reminding you of what you're not actually getting or what you don't actually have. And so when you're going through this experience or you're putting yourself through this experience, yeah, it hurts a lot. If we talk back about your own experience too, and I, I think this is honestly the truth, I think that when men, especially when they're in a, in a marriage relationship or they're you know in a situation like that, if it, I don't think they understand the damage that it can do to your partner if you are um you know i mean it becomes a degrading situation and honestly i i just wish the men would think about it you know i, I think a lot of guys and i, I like i said I, I know that i have a lot of different kinds of men that listen a lot of people have already tuned it out you know i'm hoping that there's some guys who are like i don't agree with this but i'm going to listen because it's intriguing um you know, I, I think it's worth asking these questions rather than just assuming that it's an animal biological function that we all have to just do. Like, it, there's more to this than that. Yeah, one of the ways that I like explaining the dynamic between, because you said that's not, you know, deeply satisfying. I like explaining this dynamic the same way that you look at fruit versus fruit juice. So they say if you're dieting or you're into health, an apple is healthy. It's great for you. Glass of apple juice, absolute trash. Don't, it's not good for you. Why? Because the apple juice is basically just the sugar. It doesn't have the fiber. It's not going to be digested in the same way. You're missing a lot of the nutrients. Love and sex are kind of the same way. When you just have the physical experience without the emotional experience, it's a peak in dopamine, but your body doesn't process it the same way. Your brain doesn't process it the same way. That's why in, in movies and and media and even real life experiences, like a hookup is just like in and out and done. And that's not how our body wants to process this. This is not the healthy way. When it's with love, it makes you healthier. It makes you more confident. It helps you to live a longer life and a more satisfying life. And you see all of these incredible benefits when there's sex in a loving marriage, as opposed to the hookup form of sex that doesn't have the same doesn't have the same benefits. Yeah, there are additional hormones that are released even after, you know, just physiologically released after, you know, when the oxytocin and things like that that happen in, in, in those kinds of situations. So, yeah, I think that there's, you know, and when you say this to a lot of people, again, in our culture, they look at you like you're crazy. You're like, well, you're just a prude. No, I mean, there's actual science to <laughs> to back some of this up, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why my focus has never been, I am, I am a Christian. I'm deeply religious, spiritual. I care a lot about that, but that's not how I do my coaching. That's not how I run my business. Because for me, it comes down to this idea of at the end of the day, pornography, masturbation, any form of sex addiction, it is not helping us as humans achieve what is biologically, what I see as biologically our deepest goal, which if you look at animals in the animal kingdom that bond for life, humans are at the very top. 
We are so emotional about our breakups and the people that we're with and our deaths, more so than wolves or albatross or penguins, any of these other animals. Because deep down as humans, we long for a loving partnership. And for me, anything that gets in the way of a loving partnership then is unhealthy and toxic for us. And so it comes down to rational thinking. Like if you want a loving lifelong partner, how do you achieve that? Is it by watching porn? No, it's not. Is pornography going to help you have a deeply loving? No, it's not. Is it going to help your children become better people? No, it's not. And so any way you come at this, can you do it for fun? Sure. But is it the rational choice that's going to produce the best outcomes for you, your family, the community, your life, your success? Absolutely not. Heather, I think you've given us some really good things to think about. And uh, I think it's really, really good and really challenging. And I think there's a lot of guys who really need to hear this. And there's might be some women who need to hear this too, because I know that it's not just guys that struggle, you know, I mean, it, it, it kind of goes across the board, you know? Um, so I like to ask all of my guests a couple of questions and, uh, it's okay if it takes you a minute to kind of think about this one, but I like to ask it because I think it gives us a little bit of insight into you and who you are and how you think, um, which I think ad adds value to your message. And that question is this, if young Heather walks in the room, you know, six, seven, eight years old, and you've got the opportunity, she doesn't know that you're her, or maybe she does. I don't, I don't know. We're not going to worry about the space time continuum so much, but <laughs> you get the opportunity to talk to her and tell her something that she needs to hear. What are you going to tell her? I think we'd sit down and talk about how to make good decisions. I think for me, I've come a long way in being able to understand kind of the balance between following your heart and, you know, listening to your gut and thinking through decisions all the way. Um, and I think I've definitely found some balance in that. I won't get into everything I figured out, but good decision making, I think, is something I've I'd want to coach myself on. Yeah, I I think that's awesome. I think that's good advice. And then the next question is this: What is the best advice that you have for the guys that are listening today? Honestly, I would say if you are watching and you are not fully convinced that you should quit or that it's even a problem. So start to look at the ways that it could be negatively affecting your life. Just really dig deep, have some honest talks with yourself and look, is it spending your time in, a right, in the right way? Is it helping you reach your personal goals, your financial goals, or is it distracting from those things? Is it, um, is it weakening you? And really look into not the research online, because in my opinion, the research online is paid off by the porn industry. It's on their blog, so it makes sense. But really look in your own personal life and see how it's affecting you. And then for anyone trying to quit who's actively in this process, I would just say, don't ever forget and don't lose sight of the fact that you absolutely have the ability to quit. People do every single day. You absolutely can. Don't give up. Just stay, just stay in the fight because you will get there. If you stay in the fight and put your mind to it, you will get there and it, your life will be infinitely better. Awesome. Heather, if the guys want to know more about the work that you're doing, if they want to get, maybe they need some help or maybe they just want to research, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? So my website is fightthebeast.org. So um, that's a great way to do it. You can also check out my social media channels, send me messages on there. Um, and yeah, I would love to see people get involved. For me, Fight the Beast is more than just a coaching business. For me, it's really a movement to improve our communities and, and the lives of the people we love. And so I love to see people get involved in any way they can. Awesome. Heather, uh, your insights are helpful. They're valuable. And I do believe that the guys that are watching today are going to get some good stuff. And I hope that they check out your site and learn some more. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you very much for being on the show today.
Hey guys, let's give a round of applause to Heather for sharing her story, for sharing the things that she has learned, and for investing the time to help men level up and be better. I think that she's doing good work and we want to support her. So please, if you want to support the work she's doing, if you want to benefit from the work she's doing, you can go to her website at fightthebeast.org and uh, let's continue to think about these things and let these things sink in and make a difference in our lives, guys. Hey, listen, uh, if you believe in the work that we're doing here at Manlyhood, you can support us by going to our iTunes page if or Apple Podcast page or Spotify, leave a rating, a review. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel and share the videos and the episodes with people that you know would benefit from them. Help us spread the word about what we're doing here at Manlyhood. Also, don't forget to go to the manlyhood.com slash store where you can pick up some t-shirts, mugs, and other merch, and you can help support what we're doing. I love you guys. I care about you, and I'll see you next time. If you want to be a better man, check out our website, manlyhood.com, for blogs, videos, and more from our Manlyhood team. And you can also join our private Facebook group, Manlyhood Man Cave, where you can meet up with a band of brothers who will challenge you and help you on your journey of manhood. This episode is produced by Hatcher Media for Manlyhood.com. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you're listening to the show. Tune in again for more of the Manlyhood Mancast.